Hey, good morning. Uh, if you want to see me be funnier than Oscar again at Pecha Kucha, it's today at uh, 6.45, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, this presentation is, uh, is called Three Stages of the Mobile Games Marketing Lifecycle. So this, this, kinda, this, this topic is something that I've been um, thinking about a lot uh, over the past year. Having worked as a consultant um, before doing what I'm doing now, I just saw a lot of companies uh, do really well uh, launching a game and then get stuck in that kind of launch mentality when trying to scale it. Um, and wasting a lot of money and, and, and sort of being, being like unable to, to, to move the game into a uh, position where they could kind of profitably grow it um, with the sort of different sets of uh, skills and tactics that you need at the second stage uh, and then the third stage. So I, I, I built this presentation to kind of address that. So who am I? Uh, I work for a company called Network. Network is a mobile gaming uh, developer. We have a game called Legendary Game of Heroes, kind of consistently top 100 grossing. Um, I joined Network through the acquisition of my own company called Agamemnon, and I am uh, building uh, our, our, let's say, publishing platform at, at Network. I also run the website Mobile Dev Memo, and I wrote a book called Freemium Economics. Uh, Prior to doing what I'm doing now, I worked at Skype, Rovio, and uh, Agamemnon, which is my own, my own company. Uh, so the structure of the presentation, I'll start with just kind of an overview of what it means to do mobile UA for games in the year 2017, and then I'll move into the three stages of the mobile marketing life cycle, which I identify as the honeymoon stage, the growth stage, and the strategy stage. So what does it mean to do mobile UA for games in 2017? This kind of a market overview. Um, this is from a report that Comscore released a few weeks ago. If, if, um, if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend downloading it. It's really good. Uh, so basically, this graph on the left shows the share of individual users' time spent on apps by rank. So like the rank meaning the, the app they used most kind of uh, in ascending order. And, and you see that for smartphones, almost half of a user's time is spent in their favorite app, right? And then it, there's kind of like a, a long tail, and it, and it, it sort of uh, it, it drops off very quickly. Um, and then uh, the top right graph um, is, is kind of like an, a pretty impactful one that I've been using in presentations for years. Um, and this gets published every year, so it's not really changing. And it says that the majority of smartphone users download zero apps per month, right? So if you kind of put these two things together, it means that people aren't really downloading new stuff because they have all the stuff that they like and they spend almost half of their time in the one thing that they like the most on their, on their phone, right? Which kind of for UA means it's really hard to compete for that attention um, and hard being, well, okay, people aren't actively going to download apps and so the only way to really get someone to download your app is to put an ad in front of them. Um, but that said, uh, there, are, you know, there are some reasons to be optimistic. Uh, so I think a lot of people kind of have this belief that uh, engagement has decreased, um, especially in mobile games, over the last few years, and that's actually not true. So Unity did a study with Sensor Tower, and they found that actually engagement was up 20% uh, uh, from Q4 uh, 2015 to Q4 2016. So people are actually spending more time in games. They're just spending more time in their favorite game or their favorite set of games rather than downloading a bunch of new games and in increasing the amount of time they spend that way. Um, and then one interesting thing happened recently, which I think is kind of portends a broader trend in the marketplace, which is that in late August, the day after the Conor McGregor uh, fight, there was only one game in the top five grossing. And this has happened a couple of times since then, uh, which is, I think, if you, know, if you would have looked at the top five grossing two years ago, it would be all games. And now there's only one game at one point, and, and, this, and Tinder was number one at one point. So games don't sort of dominate the top grossing in the way that they did two years ago or maybe even one year ago. Games are a participant in the top grossing, but they, it's not exclusively games at this point. Which is cool if, if you work outside of games, but if you work in games, it could be kind of scary because all these big companies now are competing in the ads marketplace against you. Um, the flip side of that is that actually that top grossing amount of money generated now is, is even higher, right? So you don't have to necessarily be top one grossing to make a lot of money. You could be top 10 and still make a, a pretty substantial amount. Um, and so kind of putting all that together, you, you can see that the amount of money being spent on mobile ads is increasing year over year, and it's, it's projected to grow 
um, pretty consistently through uh, the end of this decade. Um, and then one kind of interesting chart. So my friend Ben put this together uh, from Nanigan's data. And this just basically shows uh, kind of average CPMs for these two categories. So the bottom is gaming, the top is e-commerce. I think those are kind of relevant because, well, especially kind of prior to the, you know, the, um, the rise of all these streaming apps, you know, uh, competing for the top grossing slots, e-commerce would have been the category that gaming would have competed with most directly. And you see, like, the CPMs are just kind of consistently rising um, month over month. And I wouldn't expect that to change. Uh, you know, Facebook isn't really growing that fast in the developing world in terms of new users. And so the more advertisers that, advertisers that pile in to reach those users, the, the higher CPMs go. And so kind of taking all that as like a backdrop uh, in, you know, a backdrop of the advertising marketplace, I kind of put together this, um, this graph of kind of where I see the, the gaming ecosystem in terms of, um, you know, acquisition costs versus unit monetization. And if you kind of would draw a line, like a diagonal line from the, um, the origin of this graph through like the top right corner, I think you can kind of see where, uh, you know, where these, these, the distribution of these, these dots would kind of show where like the sort of potential is in terms of running profitable UA. So this, just some context for this, I kind of see this as being like, if you consider all of these categories as being like run well and operating at scale, um, this would be like the kind of placement would represent where the, the marginal acquisition cost is, right? So the cost of one more user, right? So not starting from zero, a hyper casual game is going to have a lower, obviously going to have a really low acquisition cost. But like when I, when, I, when, I rep when I draw these dots to represent the game categories, I mean, think of these as like any game in this category being like at max possible scale. And so you see that, um, you know, for some game types, it would be more costly at like the marginal level to acquire a user. I don't think that's like, most people probably intu intuitively know that. But the size of these dots represents what I believe to be kind of like scale, right? So like, you're gonna get, you, you have more possible scale for a hyper casual game than a social casino game. Uh, that's just, I, I feel like that's kind of intuitive and it's, it's kind of just like a, tr a truism. Um, and it's cheaper to acquire a marginal user at scale for a hyper casual game than a social casino game. The question is, okay, well, that unit cost um, minus the acquisition cost at scale, what, what actually drives more money for me? And like what, if I'm a studio and I'm thinking about what game categories to invest in or like whether to continue to invest in a game category, how should I do that? Why, and, and what kind of decisions should I make? And what kind of information should inform that decision? And I think like thinking about it this way helps you take a look at like, well, okay, if I have a ton of cash in the bank, it's okay to go for anything that is high on, uh, is, is like farther, uh, it's further up, right? Because I have money to, to spend on that. If I don't have a lot of cash in the bank, I need to go for something that's further down. Um, and then the, the further right I go, that generally corresponds with how much money I have to pay to acquire somebody, right? Assuming the market is rational and people are pricing their uh, ads at the, the level of what they think those users are worth. And um, so then kind of taking a step back from that, what, what are the components of a growth strategy for a mobile gaming company? So actually, I, one point I wanted to make. So, any, so if you think about these game categories, if you attach an IP to, some, to these and the IP fits with the game category and it makes sense and it's, it's beneficial to that game, you could potentially move these dots uh, down, right? So an IP would like, at best, it could drag the dot down and give you like basically better acquisition costs for the same level of monetization. At worst, it could move it like up and to the left. Right, so you actually decrease the monetization and increase the acquisition cost. So I think that's that's one thing that you need to consider when if you're thinking about IP. Um, if it doesn't work for you, it could definitely work against you. It wouldn't necessarily just be like a net a, a net zero like addition. So then, kind of thinking about the different components of a growth strategy for a mobile game, I kind of bucket them this way. So there's sort of like direct response, user acquisition, so just buying ads on, for example, Facebook or Unity, uh, cross promoting within your own network, and then um, using brand reach to, to kind of uh, touch more users than you otherwise could have. 
So, so like if you think about companies that are using these strategies, like I think these games, um, you could say probably only really use direct response user acquisition. Like they don't cross promote, they don't really have brands attached to them, it's just buying ads, right? Um, Ketchup would be a good example of a company, and this kind of represents all Ketchup games. Example of a company that really only uses cross promotion. They have a big network, they don't really run ads, they don't have any brand, it's just launching a game and cross promoting it. And then, you know, Pokemon Go or, or Clash Royale, they don't really run UA, they don't really do any cross promotion, it's just the brand reach, right? I mean, Nantic didn't do any UA when they launched Pokemon Go, it was just the Pokemon brand that got them users. And then some companies, use combinations of these things. So like uh, Marvel Contest of uh, Heroes or, or uh, Contest of Champions or Galaxy Heroes, they use both brand reach and direct response UA, uh, as well as uh, EA's Madden game. Um, you know, Angry Birds uses uh, a combination of all three. King uses a combination of all three for the, the Candy Crush uh, titles. And so these are, you know, if you think about your growth strategy, you could piece it together from all three of these components using some combination of, of two or three of them or just one. Right, so moving into the three stages of the user acquisition life cycle. So I kind of map it out like this. Um, so the y-axis is kind of app exposure, like you could call that like cumulative app exposure, like total app exposure over time. So it's basically how many people has this app ever been, this game ever been exposed to. And on the right is, is time, right? So how, uh, what, how long has it been since I've been promoting the app, and then I split the uh, stages up this way. So the honeymoon stage, you see kind of like the rapid increase in exposure in a pretty limited amount of time. The growth stage is kind of like, you know, growing exposure, but uh, less, less quickly and more, more kind of like steadily and consistently. And then the strategy stage is where you're basically just like very, very incrementally increasing exposure over a longer period of time. And I think you could... The, the points at which these stages start would be different for like multiple types of games and it would also depend on the strategy you're using. So there's not like a fixed timeline for these. It's not like, you know, honeymoon stage lasts six months. I've, I've seen games, especially on Facebook, where like Facebook Canvas games, uh, where the honeymoon stage lasted years or it lasted like weeks. So the honeymoon stage, some kind of characteristics of that. So the game is new to everybody. So everybody you show an ad to for the game is seeing that for the first time. Right, and so by definition, the people that are the best fit for that game are seeing the game for the first time, and they're clicking pretty readily, right? Because they, hey, this game is awesome for them. This is the first time they're ever hearing about it. I'm definitely going to click on this and install it, right? So you're getting the high CTRs at that point. Because, well, after the best people have seen it, the not best people are seeing it, and they're not going to click so readily, right? So the CTRs are always going to be highest in the honeymoon stage, which generally means the CPIs are going to be lower. Um, and so it, also in this stage, you know, if your marketing spend is constrained for some reason, right, you, just, you have a limited amount of money in the bank to spend on marketing the game, then what happens is your team only focuses on like the top tier channels, right? So like I only have X amount of money to spend. Like let's say I only have a million to spend over the next month, right? Well, I mean, I could easily spend a million just on Facebook in a month. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with the highest tier uh, ad distribution channels, and I'll move down as I saturate those channels with budget and have to move beyond the best, right? But in the honeymoon stage, if you are constrained by budget, then you'd only be working on the highest tier channels, and so you'd be getting like the best traffic, right? So the, that's why it's called the honeymoon stage. You have the highest tier, uh, you have the highest uh, CTRs, the lowest CPIs, and also you're getting those low CPIs off of like the best possible users, and so it, everything looks really great. And you can do this with just a pretty small team because if you're only working on like three, four, five channels, you don't need that many people to run UA. Um, so one question though I see people uh, bump into is, is kind of considering like, well, okay, the honeymoon stage is great. I get high CTRs, low CPIs, I don't need to grow the team. Should I aim to blow through this as fast as possible and spend as much money uh, as fast as possible before I hit the CPI pressure, before I, before I saturate those great channels? Or should I do it more slowly um, so that I can enjoy this honeymoon stage for longer. In the end, I would have acquired the same number of users, but it was just like, in, I, I would leave more kind of gas in the tank if I only try to hit here um, with, my, with you know, the first month rather than uh, hit here in the first month. And I think, uh, I think it makes more sense to try to um, 
sorry, to try to go through the honeymoon stage as quickly as possible because A, I mean, you're gonna need to do that just strategically. You're gonna have to figure out a way to acquire users off of like a broad spectrum of networks and grow the team. And if you think about your game as being, you know, a long lasting like 10 year product that generates revenues, uh, you, I, would, I, would, I would argue that it makes sense to move as quickly as possible into that, um, you know, growth machine phase. But I'm, there are pros and cons. So the pros are that if you move really quickly through that stage, there's not a lot of time for fast followers to copy you and potentially unseat you as the person or the, the company that owns that game type. Um, the market doesn't have time to get bored with that type of game. Uh, and high absolute spend equals high absolute vira virality at saturation. So the more you spend, the more users you acquire, the more absolute viral users you're going to get. And that obviously equates to like an absolute value of money that you're getting. Uh, the cons, though, is that the game could get better, right? So if I'm spending all this money on a game that's not optimal, uh, I'm kind of leaving money in the table. There's kind of like an opportunity cost of not just improving the game and then spending money. But you could always make that argument. That argument is not exclusive to this. Anything probably gets better over time. Um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of a, I think that's kind of a weak argument. So the next stage is the growth stage. So this is the stage at which the game has scaled to sort of the max profitable, uh, the max possible profitable, vo profitable volume across the tier one networks. And you have to, the only way to really uh, acquire more users is to onboard new networks. And so you kind of go down the priority list of like networks in terms of quality. And so I've saturated the, the, the best uh, possible networks and I'm sort of like operating on max volume on those. And now I have to add in more networks. And the more networks you add in, the more people you generally have to bring onto the team. So it introduces not only just some challenges for um, you know, dealing with less, lower quality traffic, but now you've got like HR headaches. You have to hire people. Um, you have to onboard them and all that stuff. So uh, you know, in this phase, you're increasing the number of channels. You're also increasing uh, your UA headcount. And this is generally when people move into like automating UA tasks, especially reporting, right? So if you're only operating on five networks or so, you can do reporting manually. If you're operating on 10 or 12 or 15, you generally have to bring in some form of automation to pull all the data and analyze it. Um, and so again, this is just a different focus now. You're not just having one person doing direct response marketing, but you've got an analytics person or maybe you've even got an engineer. And so the team has diversified. Uh, and the strategy stage is the point at which direct response advertising no longer drives new users profitably at sufficient volume, so you can't really scale your direct response. It exists at some level of volume, and that's, it's saturated. You can't use direct response to, 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 to uh, bring on incremental volume, and you have to go to sort of different forms of advertising. Um, and so this is when you see people kind of trying to adopt brands. They do like um, a brand integration, or they do like partnerships. They go out of home, they go to TV, um, all that kind of stuff. They go influencer. I mean, you might go influencer earlier, but in a direct response approach, and now you're just sort of like generally doing influencer. This is probably the scariest stage because this is the stage where you're sort of just push, pushing money out, um, maybe even with a framework for evaluating whether that money will come back uh, profitably, but it's really sort of like unknown generally. I mean, if you're doing this stuff for the first time, and you're doing it in a way where the payback period is maybe longer, um, the, uh, the, the medium is not as, is not as trackable. It's, it can be scary to push money into this. It, it feels intimidating. Um, and so I think generally the companies you see get to this stage are like bigger. Um, they've you know, brought in kind of like seasoned experts that of, you know, for advertising on these kind of uh, formats. Um, and they've spent a lot of time thinking about how um, how all of these different you know, media formats convert into installs and how those installs uh, pay out, right? So they don't just sort of do it blindly, but they kind of come up with a framework that attaches a value even to um, channels and media formats that aren't directly attributable. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of like the most sort of nebulous format, but, but you know, kind of... Um, uh, you know, conversely and, and uh, almost a little bit confusingly, the companies that master this are the most analytical, right? Because they take the very, very analytical approach, even though it's a little bit abstract, and apply it to these formats that aren't attributable, attributable directly. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. I hope you have a good day. Thank you very much. So, uh, any
Anyone got a quick question for Eric? There's a question around the back there. I'm going to come running around and uh, see so you get a combined host and microphone conveyor. Hey, Eric. Um, you said uh, that when you're buying user acquisition in the honeymoon stage, you want to use the tier one networks first. Wouldn't you maybe want to use the lower networks with lower CPIs to get those brand new users? Why would you go straight to the best network first? Um, well, that I think ties into the argument that I made. It's like, well, there'd always, you'd always have a better product. It's not, like, there's never going to be a point when the product is done. I mean, if you're operating a, a free-to-play game, hopefully for 10 years, I mean, it's probably going to get better and better all the time. Um, the reason you wouldn't want to start with the lower tier networks is because there's a lot of like manual work that goes along with running ads on a low tier network. So you need to be constantly sort of monitoring that for fraud. They generally don't have really good APIs. Um, if they have APIs at all, um, you've got to, you know, it, it, they, they, they require a lot of hand holding with the account managers. The, the top tier networks you can just sort of like plug and play because uh, they've invested in tech and because they're really good and they, they're, they're really good at what they do, right? So like if you started with the tier two networks, you'd have to scale up the team beyond what would be required if you just started with the tier one networks. So you'd, you'd have more overhead and you'd be, you'd be focusing on things, uh, you know, that are ancillary to just, just buying media.